And now we're talking to Jim Wang, who is the software engineering manager at Corva. Corva is uh, a provider of telemetry and data analytics services for the oil and gas industry. And welcome to the next database platform, Jim. Yeah, thank you. Uh, glad to be here. Yeah, I've been with Corva for a little bit over two years now, really trying to scale the platform to enable real-time calculation and provide value back to the drillers as they're drilling in order to close the uh, data loop. All right, so let's, let's uh, take this at a high level. Uh, let's talk about the problems that the oil and gas industry are trying to solve and what your platform does, and then we'll talk about all the bits and pieces that you brought together to make this happen. And I, we're obviously particularly interested in the database once we get the overall picture of what the platform is. So let's start at the highest level, talk about what the business is doing, and then we'll talk about the systems that make it happen. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, traditionally, oil and gas has a lot of data. They value, uh, at, hey, how many terabytes, petabytes of data we have. But a lot of those values does not provide a lot of value to the oil and gas operators. They collect the data and they really don't take any action on the real time. So what differentiates us is that we take data in real time and do a lot of calculations as the data are coming in using streaming database, using Mongo, and provide the data value back to the driller within a matter of seconds. It could be dashboards, it could be real-time comparison, and it could be machine learning provide recommendations how they drill. Uh, the most importantly, I think we value on the platform is the alerting capabilities. We all seen um, accidents happen in oil and gas fields. Using our system, we're enabling the real-time calculation of data to match the predictive value with the actual value in order to really provide a safety measure as well. So this is literally for drilling only, or is it for other aspects of, of the oil and gas uh, operation? We started off Corva as drilling only. We have since migrated into hydraulic fracturing. Uh, we actually also migrated into production as well. So we currently uh, in the market for drilling over 30% of drilling rigs in North America, and we're very fastly growing in other segments as well. Oh. That's really a good penetration. So uh, for a company that's so young as well, um, how, how much data is coming off of a drilling rig or a hydrofracking rig? And, and uh, you know, what do you do with it? You know, it's, how is it gathered? How does it get beamed back to the Corva application? What's the trail? Well, uh, it's actually a pretty long, uh, pretty interesting question. Uh, I'll answer it in a few phases. Uh, as they're drilling, there are sensors on the drilling rig, and there are actually sensors as they're drilling at the downhole sensors. Uh, the data actually are not coming in at the same time. If you imagine the sensor at the bit, it's a little bit slower coming through from the rig. Uh, we capture this data all using uh, the, uh, the, uh, the data capturing device at the rig. Um, it could be as few as probably 30 channels, what we call it, 30, 30 uh, different data points coming in every second. It could be as many as 400. Uh, these data come usually via a cloud provider that the oil and gas industry traditionally uses. Uh, we recently actually introduced our own IoT sensor, uh, IoT data capture device that provides data in a much faster realm. Um, once we get the data there in one second intervals, we process this data using uh, a series of uh, calculation databases, including Kafka and a lot of AWS Lambda. Uh, how much data is coming into our database? Uh, we grow our database about 110 gigabytes per day. Um, and we're probably growing at about 20 to 30% every quarter as well. Gotcha. And obviously you're a SaaS uh, provider. You live in the cloud, you're born in the cloud, and you're not gonna try to run your own data center, I assume. No. Absolutely All right. not. All right. So, and, and it sounds like you're on AWS for uh, your database platforms uh, and the Lambda service. So you use Mongo running on, um, on AWS. What, what way do you do it? Do you roll your own? Do you use a Mongo service? What do you, what do you do? Um, this was the balance between how much time do we want to dedicate hosting this and how to scale it. Uh, as you know, earlier I mentioned, we have 110 gigabytes per day of data growth, which means uh, every couple of months we have to really try to sh add shard to it to enable horizontal scaling. Ultimately, we chose Atlas for one, uh, their easy of use, and two, the support that the Atlas uh, service provides. Right. And Atlas, of course, is the cloud service implementation of Mongo that Mongo itself runs, so you don't have to. <laughs> yeah, 
it, so it, it saves a lot of uh, DevOps hours, a lot of headaches. Uh, it, it, it really, it's a, it's a peace of mind that we just, you know, we could focus on something else. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the key. So why, why a document database for such kind of data? I would have thought uh, you might want to use a time series database or is there time series extensions in here that I'm unaware of? Um, you know, what's, what's the reasoning behind Mongo for the piece that you're using it in? A few factors. One, we wanted this platform enabling every different segment of the oil and gas industry. So, uh, when we started with drilling, we had this mindset of let's just try to own the data capturing and the real-time data sensitivity of all of oil and gas. So we needed a, a database that, that allow us to grow. Um, we, so one of the, the, the factors is that not all the data comes in are the same. Um, even our drilling uh, sensor data uh, collection, um, some of the, the data capturing point are only 40, some of the wells only produce 40 data points and some of the well produces 400 data points. So right. for traditional database, we're not gonna have a table for each single well, that's just, it's not realistic. So for Mongo that enabled us, when you have more data, we're actually capturing it. And when you have fewer data rows, that's fine. We just you know use a flex schema. Uh, and the other one is allow us to have a very simple API endpoint uh, for all the collections. I think we have probably north of 200 collections. We only use one uh, API endpoint. And the API endpoint is data driven where you actually tell the data uh, endpoint where you want to push the data to and it figured out uh, the, the, you know, the required schemas and then everything else, it, it could be as, as free form as you want. Is the nature of this data that you're collecting, is it something that you keep forever for all wells for all time so that you can do advanced analytics on it, in which case that means you have to keep all this data? Or is it something that has a shelf life? I don't know if old drilling data for a, for a well that's no longer being used is useful or not. So what's the lifespan of the data you're, you're capturing? Because that gives us a sense of how big does this thing get, how quickly? Um, currently, we're actually storing all the data and we actually don't have any short-term plans to archive the data per se into a data lake. Uh, why is that? So right now, we our value is providing real-time data uh, where the other aspect of it, we're providing real-time data that compare it to your historical data. Um, that could be both a pure mathematical calculation and machine learning calculations. We provide these feedback utilizing the data that we already have to provide more value to you. So once we archive the data, we cannot utilize that data anymore. So there might be a future, maybe in the next year or so, to segment this data into geographical areas, uh, mm -hmm. such as you know, Permian Basin in West Texas or you know, North Dakota. Um, but longer term, uh, in reality, yeah, older data might not be as valuable anymore, right? So the well that you drilled, say, 10 years ago, probably not going to provide more value as the well you drilled a, a year ago. So, yeah, eventually we will probably have, a, have, have to have some sort of an archiving rule to, you know, legacy data, sure, we'll put it off as S3 or something. Gotcha. And then do you, do you have a sense of the exact size of this thing right now? I mean, are you in tens of 30, petabytes? Two terabytes right now, but growing pretty fast. I'll say that again. Uh, 32 terabytes. Okay. That's, that's not, not huge. It's not that yeah. bad. Okay. Yeah. You can, you can handle that. <laughs> yeah. Core, core is relatively new right now, but, but we are adding a shard every like month or two. So, so there, there is a theoretical limit on how fast we want this to grow. Sure. And then as you add more services for your customers, it'll grow organically that way as well. Absolutely. It's right now it's growing more horizontally because just, you know, number of wells that we're keeping adding on to it, but we're slowly growing vertically as well into different segments, into different areas. So you've got Mongo at the heart of this for the telemetry data storage coming off the wells. What do you have other databases that you use as well? And then, I mean, Kafka is not as a database as such. It's more like a bunch of pipes, but do you have other databases you use in conjunction with Mongo? Uh, right now, our application layer runs on uh, a Postgres database. Uh, it's a much smaller uh, database. It's probably uh, less than 100 gigabytes. Um, so it runs our core infrastructure, such as rules, uh, maybe uh, scheduling, and, and, and the well relationship. So anything that has to do with the relationship between objects, uh, we actually use Postgres for that. Gotcha. And you're not worried about scalability at this point. I mean, Mongo was designed particularly to deal with scale and the frustrations of scale. 
So that's, I mean, you're not anywhere near where Mongo can take you, I assume. Worrying is probably not the right word. We're pretty comfortable at where we're at right now. Um, obviously, we want to think, say, what's two years down the road? How do we scale this 100x? And with the current application design, I don't think we're at the 100x of currently we are at right now. So we, you know, we're probably not ready for three to four petabyte of data. But you know, that both um, probably is a consideration on how we want to scale Mongo and how we can efficiently use Mongo at this point. Uh, last question here. When you were when you were building the system, did you what did you look at for alternative database technologies for this piece of uh, the platform? I mean, there obviously, if you were looking at uh, running on AWS, there's Redshift, there's DynamoDB, there's all kinds of things. You could have got a time series database, other kinds of databases. But and I understand why you picked a document database because of the variability of each well in terms of the data that's collected. That makes sense to me. Um, yeah. But what other things did you look at? So there are, there are a few factors. One is adaptability of the technology. So we, we look at the Cassandra a little bit, um, also document DB from, from Amazon. Um, also when we settled on Mongo for a few factor. One is, you know, there are more people using Mongo when we started using this. So more people are uh, more aware of it. And Mongo was maturing at the pretty uh, uh, solid rate as, you know, as far as features, uh, stability uh, was a big concern. Um, and the other one is pricing, right? So, so pricing with Mongo, with the, the sh how, how the sharding is designed, we have a very predictable uh, roadmap on like, hey, where, how much is this gonna cost us? Uh, I, I think with some of the other solution, the, the cost was actually a little bit higher than we would like. Gotcha. Well, thanks for uh, telling us all about how Corva is making use of MongoDB and other technologies, and we appreciate the time. Absolutely, thank you.